Uh, may may recognize Charlie Corsmo as the prolific and important business law scholar, uh, which he certainly is. Some of you may represent him from re recognize him from his prior life as a child actor. We won't talk about that. But what you probably did not know is that a is that a a young Charles Corsmo, one of his first jobs was actually at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, which is one of the reasons why I asked him to uh, uh, join us today. Um, uh, in our uh, discussion of environmental law in the EPA. So without any further ado, I will turn things over to Charlie. Thanks, and, and thank you uh, th thank you all for sticking out uh, through the last panel. We have another uh, terrific panel for you today. And, and Jonathan's right, actually. I mean, my, my field is uh, corporate law, but if you don't count the shameful child actor jobs I had, uh, the EPA was, in fact, my very first, uh, my very first paying job. So I worked... Uh, uh, in the Office of Policy, Economics, and Innovation. Uh, and uh, I, I looked it up uh, today, though, and now it's just the Office of Policy. So Economics and Innovation <laughs> uh, got the hook at some point in the last, uh, in the last 10 years uh, uh, for some reason. Uh, but, uh, but this panel is going to discuss uh, the many ways in which the EPA has influenced uh, state environmental policy, uh, domestically and uh, uh, also environmental policy uh, internationally, uh, both in uh, individual nations and in uh, various uh, international bodies. Uh, the format's going to be the same. Each speaker, uh, I believe, will have 15 minutes uh, to talk, and then we, we should have a good, a good amount of time for a, a discussion, uh, both among the panel and with the, uh, uh, with the audience. Uh, uh, so I will uh, introduce our speakers uh, uh, briefly. Uh, immediately to my left, Right, stage left here uh, to bring in my old <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Percival, uh, Robert Percival. He's the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law and the Director of the Environmental Law Program at the uh, University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, following his graduation from Stanford Law School, Professor Percival uh, clerked for Justice White uh, and was uh, later a senior attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, prior to joining the faculty at Maryland, where he's now the principal author of the most widely used uh, environmental case law book uh, in the country uh, and is uh, an internationally recognized scholar of environmental law. Uh, moving one, uh, one further over is uh, uh, Katrina Wyman. Professor Wyman is the Her Sarah Herring Soren Professor of Law at NYU Law School uh, and also serves uh, as director of the Environmental and Energy LLO LLM program uh, and Deputy Faculty Director of the Guarini Center on Environmental Energy and Land Use Law. Uh, she holds degrees from the University of Toronto and from Yale. Uh, and uh, like all of our panelists, is an internationally renowned scholar of, uh, uh, I'm going to stop saying that at the end of, uh, at the end of each of That applies across the board, right? Uh, without further ado, right? Uh, professor Vandenberg, Michael Vandenberg, is the David Daniels Allen Distinguished Professor of Law at Vanderbilt. Uh, as well as director of Vanderbilt's uh, Climate Change Research Network and co-director of its Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program. Uh, he also did a tour of duty uh, in, the, uh, in the trenches at, uh, at the EPA, although somewhat uh, higher up in the trenches, if that works as, that doesn't work, but uh, uh, he wasn't as deep into the, into the, all right. Uh, yeah, it was a different trench. Uh, with, the trenches yeah. means you, the tr your head was up when they started. That's right. <laughs> exactly. He that's was, the most accurate thing. So uh, that's right. He, he had to go over the top into the machine guns more often than I did. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, all the way over on the end is Jonathan Gilligan. Dr. Gilligan is a, is a physicist, uh, actually, by training uh, with degrees from Swarthmore and Yale uh, and is Associate Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and of Civil and Engi Environmental Engineering uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, in addition to his, uh, his earlier work in experimental physics, uh, Dr. Gilligan is now engaged in uh, interdisciplinary research into interactions between uh, human behavior, uh, society, and the environment. Uh, and has published numerous uh, influential articles on uh, on sustainability law and policy. So uh, welcome to all our, our, our panelists, and we will... Who's starting here? Good. I'm going to start. Okay, go for it. So uh, thank you all for sticking, the, sticking it out. I find it's always fascinating to talk to audiences uh, as the microphone comes and goes. No, as um, uh, that are a mixture of CLE uh, uh, attract attendees <laughs> and law students and professors. So you're all coming from across the the whole uh, realm of different perspectives. And let me just say that uh, we're going to do something here that is a major conceptual shift. 
um, that will either be central if you're here from a CLE perspective into what you're doing and you'll get that and it makes a lot of sense or it will seem like you just wasted 15 minutes and so let me apologize in advance if, 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 you, if you come to the latter. I don't think you will be, but you might. I'll also say briefly that um, this is both uh, deeply pessimistic. Uh, we heard a lot of conversations earlier today about oh could we actually get law or not we're going to be very pessimistic, but as I tell my students, nobody likes a sour environmentalist. We're also going to be really optimistic. We're going to offer a new way to think about environmental protection that is quite different from anything else we've talked about today. So, uh, Jonathan, you had an opening thought, too. Yeah, I just wanted to say, it just um, I really have been enjoying the chance to work with Mike in crossing disciplines between the sciences and law for a long time. It's really great to be here and see the really exciting stuff that's happening. And also a little bit of a homecoming is Case Western is a place that has a place in my heart because I spent the first four years of my life in Cleveland while my father was getting his medical degree from the uh, medical school here. And it's nice to come back a little bit older with a different perspective on things. Just just a little older. Right? Yes. Um, so I'd also just thank you to, to, to Jonathan and to Case Western. It's really remarkable what you've been able to put together here. And I think, uh, as you'll see, we believe that the polarization and the deep divide in environmental protection is a critical weakness in the system. And I think to the extent Case Western is helping to, to bridge that, it's playing a very important role. Um, so let me uh, start by asking a question here, and that, that assumes that we are able to functionally... Yes, yeah, it is working. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit uh, about a standard model of environmental governance, which is what we've talked about for the last uh, day, for uh, this entire day. And then we're going to talk about what we think is the emergence of a new model, not, not, not a complement, or, or a complement in many cases, not necessarily competing with the standard model. And then we want to take a look at one of the implications of this. And we think one of the implications goes to a point that many of you uh, will have, uh, have learned in seventh grade civics or freshman political science, which is the concept of the revolving door. And we want to suggest that, that there's a new way to think about the revolving door given this new model that's emerging in environmental governance. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with that by asking, uh, what organization recently announced an initiative uh, to reduce worldwide greenhouse gases by 1 billion tons by 2030? And Jonathan and I have this book out, which we helpfully put in front of us here. Um, and we've asked this question to literally over 100 audiences at this point. Uh, anyone have an answer? This is an amount equal to Germany going carbon neutral for a year, so you know it's not Germany alone. Walmart. Walmart, Walmart. right. <laughs> you're, you're in a small and exclusive club, Don. <laughs> but we hope very well informed. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's Walmart, right? Uh, and we think this is a new thing that's emerging. All right, we don't want to overclaim about it, but we believe that some of the most important things going on out there on the climate front in particular, but also in other areas, are, are activities by the private sector. And, and what we want to do is, uh, is talk about how, in our view, what's happening here is that over time, if we think about the traditional governmental model, there are a series of assumptions that are built in. And the first is that the actor is government. We ask when we see a problem, and so we've done all day today, what can government do? How can it do it better, et cetera. Uh, is international government, subnational, et cetera. And that then means that the actions are laws, policies, and programs. I was taught environmental law, like I assume everybody in this room, as a subset of administrative law. And our argument is that's still largely true, but there is a lot more going on in environmental governance today that's relevant to lawyers that is beyond the traditional model that we all studied. Uh, and, and as a result, the instruments that we study, the instruments we deploy for NGO uh, lawyers or government lawyers or private sector lawyers are different than they might be. And there are actually many parallels between the public and the private instruments, cap and trade or, or, or market mechanisms, prescriptive me mechanisms, information regulation, et cetera. Um, and it also, what we're finding is that private governance is actually um, uh, addressing many of the same topic areas. So we have parallel instruments in public and private governance and parallel, parallel topic areas too, is a piece that I did with Sarah Light at Wharton uh, a few years ago. So this is the traditional model. Here's a slide that Mike Gerard lets me use from Columbia. Uh, he put this together. Uh, on the left um, is uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. This is the traditional model of environmental law, right? At the in, in EPA regulations are almost twice as voluminous, at least, as the, as the tax code. So as I tell my students, we're number one, right? Uh, which doesn't make the conservatives in my class happy. Um, so. Um, 
that's the traditional model, but here's a, a, a phenomenon that I think is very hard for all of us. There's almost no one in this room who teaches or is more senior in the environmental area who didn't, didn't come through the environmental conceptualization forming process except in an era when statutes were the answer. And so what we did is we looked at what the major pollution control statutes have been since 1970, and we find uh, almost two dozen adopted between 1970 uh, and 1990. Uh, and then we look from there forward, and uh, we can argue about the federal water pollution, or the uh, water pollution control, what is it, the federal, uh, the amendments, uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act amendments of, of 2000, or 1996, right? And um, the Food Quality Protection Act of 19, you know, there, there can be minor ones. There's one at the far end there as well, which is the Lautenberg Act, which I think is the exception that proves the rule. We can talk about that maybe in questions. But essentially, if your model is what we've talked about almost all today, which is the question of when do we adopt a carbon tax or some other regulation, right, which, uh, or some other statute that then allows a regulatory answer, the answer might be that something is deeply different today that makes it unlikely that we're going to do that. And maybe that's not just true tomorrow and next year, but maybe we're in a new era. Maybe we need to be thinking a little more creatively, more generally, because we never look at these eras. I was the EPA chief of staff uh, in 1993. Right? And we're going to talk about that in just a second, uh, why that matters. Yes. So if we ask why is this, why hasn't, why has there been only one major statute in the last um, almost 30 years, is that the, um, we have big barriers to federal pollution control statutes. We saw Democrats and Republicans have generally not all lined up. This is showing over time the League of Conservation voters scores for Democrats and Republicans, the House is in the solid line, the Senate's the dashed line. There were differences, but they were fairly close together through the 70s through the 1990s. And then roughly about the time that Mike showed up at the EPA, yeah, yeah, they just completely diverge. And so now we've got a kind of partisan polarization that didn't used to occur, and that makes it much harder to make the kind of deals and negotiation to make things happen. And so we have a bunch of barriers to any new federal pollution control statutes that will go through the legislatures. First of all, you need to have a priority from the White House to push it. You need to have um, control by... Um, those who favor the legislation in the House of Representatives, and then not only a majority, but enough to override um, a filibuster and possibly a presidential veto in the Senate. And then at that point, it all gets kicked for years and years and years to the courts to sort out whether the um, statute is legitimate and how to interpret it. And all of this really stands in the way of making progress. And so what we see right now is that states that represent about 12% of the population, 5% of the vote, um, are controlling a majority of the Senate. And so it's very easy for a very small fraction of the U.S. population to block any progress on uh, making environmental legislation. Let me make a small correction on that because I changed this. Yes. So, so the, 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 that slide at the bottom there is that in the last election, 2016, the, the 18 to 24 part of the population made up 12% of the population and 5% of the vote. Uh, and that 18 to 20 percent of the U.S. population now controls 50 plus votes in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Just thinking about that as we think about, are we going to adopt a Green New Deal or whatever mm -hmm. it might be? Yes. So what we see now is if we start looking at what some of the barriers are, um, there's, a, there's a different aspect of this, which is then why do we have such big opposition by one party to adopting new um, new federal laws. And so one part is this has been a thing for a long time among advocates of environmental action is what's called the information deficit model that says just the reason that we're not seeing more action is because people don't understand how serious the problem is. And if we just explain better how serious the problem is, then the public will support strong regulations, the elected officials will fall in line and will get action. But what's found from empirical psychological research is this doesn't work. Sometimes, in fact, knowing the science better leads to people being even more opposed to new action. And one thing we see is a confirmation bias. People tend to selectively look at the data that agrees with their pre-existing beliefs, and people often exercise motivated reasoning to try to look at the evidence selectively to prove what they want to be true. And 
So one thing we can see is this is from some surveys of whether people simply think the fact, there's a factual question, are recent winters warmer than they used to be? And what we see is two pieces here. First, there's a partisan uh, determination. People who are more to the left tend to agree more that yes, the uh, scientifically winters are warmer than they used to be. People farther to the right think they're not warmer. But also the degree of that partisan effect is strongly um, dependent on whether you talk to people on the other side of the divide. So and just in simple terms, that means that our, our worldview is affecting our memory about the recent winters. So just think about how deep our worldview affects our. Yes. And then we have things where people look at these issues, and this really affects decision making. So we see, if you ask people, would you install a new energy efficient light bulb in your home? Would you buy one at the store? And what's found is, again, looking at political ideology, comparing same compact fluorescent light bulb, but with a, blank, with a label that just um, has the basic information and one that has a label that emphasizes its, its environmental benefits, we see that when you label this according to its environmental benefits, there's a very strong partisan effect. People on the left are more likely to buy it. People on the right actually become less likely to buy it once they know that it's good for the environment. <laughs> Same product. And this connects to something that we think is really at the heart of a lot of the opposition to new federal action on the environment, which is solution aversion, discovered by some psychologists at Duke University, which finds that if you don't like the solution to something, you're less likely to believe the problem exists. Um, if you ask Democrats and Republicans, do you agree with the scientific consensus that um, human activity is responsible for global warming? And you couch this in terms of asking people either, and if this is true, we're going to need government regulation to address it, or there are free market solutions to the problem. And we see that among Democrats, there's not a lot of difference here. But on the right, among the Republicans, there's a strong difference in their assessment of a scientific question, what's causing um, climate change, depending on what you tell them the solution would be. And so we believe that if we can provide alternative solutions as credible responses, we may be able to get around a lot of the debates around is the problem even happening or not. Good, and that's not just a conservative phenomenon. If you ask liberal, if you tell liberals uh, nuclear power is the solution to climate change, they get less worried about climate change, right? Just as concerned. And again, this isn't just rejecting the solution; they get less worried about the underlying problem itself. So, if you're a manager of a corporation or a university or a religious organization, you're focus, you're facing. Uh, a scenario in which we haven't had a major pollution control statute with the exception of the Lautenberg amendments in, uh, in 2016 in the last quarter century or so. Uh, and you see this, uh, this uh, worldview generated solution aversion. But by the same token, right, think about that drop off that we saw in 1990. Uh, we could call it the Elliott effect too, I guess, but for now we'll call it the, the, my, my responsibility. Uh, John doesn't think that's funny. Okay, so, 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 so um, look though, if you're a corporate manager, for example, right, has public support for environmental protection dropped off since 1990 the way the legislative activity has? Right? And I think the answer is obviously not. It's varied quite a bit. It's actually hard to find studies that ask the same question over an extended period of time, but they don't show that same drop off. So you're managing an institution, whether you're attracting new students or managing employees or whatever, in a setting in which the public still has about the same level of concern for the environment, but the congressional legislative machine has stopped operating. Whether what you wanted was more cost-efficient legislation or more expansive uh, and comprehensive legislation. So uh, what we suggest um, in our book and what pro provides the predicate here, and we'll need to wrap up, is that um, what we're seeing more and more as a result of this phenomenon is that uh, the actor in many cases as to environmental governance is moving from government to private organizations. Uh, and the actions are moving from laws, policies, and programs to a range of different things we call private initiatives, which is kind of a clunky term, but there isn't a better vocabulary for it. We see that there are parallel instruments. There are command and control standards through supply chain contracting, et cetera, just like we see command and control in the environmental area. And there are market mechanisms. Internally, uh, Microsoft has a carbon tax. Um, uh, so, uh, 
So we also see that in subject matter areas. So why is this important? 10% uh, of all the fish caught for human consumption in the world are caught uh, subject to a private standard formed by Unilever, then the largest uh, uh, seller of fresh fish in the world, and the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, roughly 15% of all of the temperate forests in the world are subject to a private sustainability standard. Uh, recently, a DC lobbyist said that the, uh, that the most important regulators of toxics in America today are, are Target and Walmart. Um, and on climate change, which is what we tend to focus on, oh, somehow a slide about our book got in here. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> Jonathan? Yeah, actually, why don't we? Yeah, we've got a lot of that. a lot is going on in that area. Let's Happy to answer questions. Let's jump ahead to the revolving door part and okay. quickly do that, and then we can leave room for leave time good. for our colleagues here. Good, good. So again, classic idea is that we we both see some advantages and some concern uh, about the notion that people revolve between uh, industry traditionally and government. That's the traditional conception of the revolving door, which might have some advantages. Yes, and so there's, yeah, there, and there are different ways people look at this. Some look at it just in an economic point of view of thinking, what are the incentives of the actors and how are they trying to game the system to their advantage? And other ones look in a richer, kind of more sociological context to it. But there can be advantages because moving back and forth between industry and a regulatory body, whether it's public or private, can bring expertise about industry process and outside experts engaging with regulatory ex, um, agencies can create a richer dialogue. Um, and we can go ahead sure. to look so, at But the principal literature in political science and law suggests concern about agency capture, that basically people while in government will be acting not in the public interest but in the corporate interest because they are thinking about moving to the private sector uh, and, and vice versa. And so that's the general concern about the revolving door. And, and what we want to suggest is, um, is that, in fact, there may be a new revolving door that has emerged. We might call it a green revolving door. So we did a little um, mini empirical study, nothing sophisticated, but we looked at the top 25 private equity firms in the U.S., and we found that four of those firms have managers in them of sustainability who've moved not from government and in, into industry and vice versa, but from an NGO into the private sector. Okay, so for example, the Carlyle Group, which is one of the most successful private equity firms in the world, has a chief sustainability officer who was formerly a top staffer at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, similarly, we looked at uh, the, the top uh, 25 uh, institutional investment firms in the world, and we find, uh, again, we find four different cases where people are moving from environmental NGOs into institutional investment firms like BlackRock uh, and PIMCO. Uh, and then we're finding a similar phenomenon um, in the corporate sector. We looked at the, the um, Fortune 100 list and we find at least seven examples of people moving again, not from, NG not from companies into government, but from NGOs into companies. So we see this revolving door that's yes. going on and uh, you know, that might suggest that uh, this is the phenomenon that's occurring because people are beginning to think less about the sector they're in than the kind of job they're in mm -hmm. uh, and it has some advantages. Yes, yeah, so you can have, as you have people moving back and forth between environ, pro-environmental NGOs and industry, this can have a greening effect on industry. And uh, some research on private governance finds that uh, corporate NGO initiatives, cooperative um, initiatives together in collaboration can really be beneficial for both the corporation and for those who favor environmental action. Um, you have potential disadvantages of the same kinds of agency capture concerns that we have with regulatory agencies can apply with NGOs. This is particularly shown up in criticisms of non-governmental private sector auditing of labor standards in uh, foreign factories. And it, uh, and it essentially can apply similarly to private sector um, environmental regulation. And there's also questions about what happens when you have conflict between the pro-environmental side and the people working on trying to assure that there's a positive bottom line. Right, you know, at the same time, we might be, we might be seeing that we would have the adverse effects that we would worry about, yes. uh, right, uh, in, in, uh, in NGOs. Uh, and, and ultimately, we might see that firms aren't performing as well as they might otherwise be financially if they're worrying too much about green issues. So, so there's right. still a lot to be looked at. So anyway, that's our concept. The basic idea is we're making this transition. Uh, it's not that, that public governance isn't critically important, but that there is a new type of activity going on out there on the private governance side, and that what we see here 
is, uh, is movement now, like you might expect, as that becomes more important from NGOs into financial firms and corporations, with some suggestion that that might be helping to green corporations, uh, but it also might end up making less green some of the NGOs at the same time, and that remains to be seen. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, let's see that. Yeah, here, and then we just have to make sure this goes. So, so yeah, pass that one down. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I, I'm glad to be in Cleveland. I grew up in the Midwest. My father lived all his life in Des Moines, Iowa, where I grew up. And he had a cousin uh, who lived on a farm 20 miles west of Des Moines in Van Meter, Iowa. And he was an outstanding high school pitcher. So the Cleveland Indians signed him at the age of 17. And in July 1936, he made his debut for Cleveland, struck out 15 batters. And the next year, the Indians decided, since he was only 18 at the time, they would invite my father, who was two years older, to travel with him and gave him a Cleveland Indian uniform. That's Bob Feller there on the left and my dad uh, on the right. Now, uh, Feller turned out to be a pretty good success. He, threw, he played for the Indians for 18 years through 279 complete games. 44 of those were shutouts, three no-hitters, 12 one-hitters. He was an American League All-Star eight times, seven times he led the league in strikeouts, and he was a first ballot Hall of Famer. Now fast forward to three weeks ago. The Cleveland Indians are still hanging by a thread to try to overtake the Brewers in the playoff race. And who do they play? The Washington Nationals, my team, at Nats Park the last three games. And I was really excited because there were lots of Cleveland Indians fans there, and several of them were wearing Bob Feller jerseys. But I was even more excited Tuesday night when after winning three elimination games, the wild card game against the Brewers, beating LA Dodgers in games four and five, <laughs> we, in four games, swept the Cardinals, and that meant that I didn't have to worry about a conflict between a, a playoff game today. <laughs> now, in my recent scholarship for the last decade, uh, Simon Yang and I have been sort of pioneering this concept of there's a fundamental change in the way law and legal evolution are happening around the world in the environmental field that traditional distinctions between private and public law, for reasons that Mike just explained, are breaking down. Traditional distinctions between international and domestic law are breaking down as countries borrow law from one another. I'm working on a book on the history of global environmental law. Siming and I and Anastasia Telesetsky and Lynn Harmon Walker have just come out with this new case book. It took us 12 years to write uh, on comparative and global environmental law and policy. Now, so I, I want to review the history of how EPA has played a major and little noticed role in the development of global environmental law. Uh, CEQ was created on January 1st, 1970. President Nixon signs the NEPA into law on New Year's Day, Day live on national television. In December 1970, EPA is created by executive order. Bill Ruckelshaus is the first administrator. And a few weeks later, Nixon signs the Clean, Energy Act, uh, Clean Air Act. Now, even from the very start, a major role EPA has played is an international scientific and technical cooperation with other countries. On May 
23, 1972, even though we're in the middle of a Cold War with the Soviet Union, the US-USSR agreement on cooperation in the field of environmental protection was signed and it renewed every five years. So despite political differences between our countries, there was tremendous cooperation among environmental scientists. The very first global environment summit was the Stockholm Conference in 1972. The US sent a 63 member delegation. The head of the delegation was Russell Train, who was the head of CEQ at the time. Bill Russell's house was also part of that delegation. And they worked out in advance a game plan for what they wanted to accomplish. At that conference, developing countries were really skeptical about the concept of global environmental regulation. Indira Gandhi famously said, when I see smoke coming out of a factory, I think jobs, I think that's good. Isn't poverty the biggest polluter of all? But the conference was a fabulous success and it was the uh, 113 countries participate. It spawned the global recognition of the importance of environmental protection, issued the Stockholm Declaration. There was an agreement to create the UN Environment Program to start negotiations on the Convention of the International Trade in Endangered Species. When Train, who had been elected vice chairman of the conference, came back, he had a press conference at the White House where he said that the US gained really all of its important objectives at the conference. Uh, and in fact, starting with that point, the nations around the world started adopting environmental framework world, uh, laws, creating national <coughs> environmental agencies and uh, environmental impact assessment, which the US had uh, pioneered, was adopted in virtually every country of the world. Now, the Reagan administration takes over. This is when I started practicing environmental law. I actually had gone to law school in Stanford, clerked in LA and the Ninth Circuit. I only wanted to live in California after my clerkship with Justice White. I got hired by the Berkeley Office of the Environmental Defense Fund. And they said, well, with Reagan coming into the office, uh, we're going to need a litigator to fight the new Reagan administration effort to roll back rules. Uh, what Reagan's statement, the trees cause more pollution than automobiles do, resulted in one of the, my favorite demonstrations where people dressed up in tree costumes and held signs that said, cut us down before we kill again. And <laughs> one of the first things that Reagan did was he appointed Vice President George H.W. Bush to form a task force on regulatory relief that literally wrote to corporate executives, particularly those in the oil industry, that uh, Bush knew well and said, what regulation should we get rid of? And at the top of their list were the limits, the very first limits on lead and gasoline that, as Don told us this morning, were upheld by the DC Circuit sitting on Bonk after a very long uh, legal fight. And in fact, EPA, at the direction of OMB and the White House, actually proposed to relax or rescind all limits on lead and gasoline. It created a complete firestorm in the public health community. And even conservative columnist George Will, who had befriended Reagan when he first moved to Washington, wrote a column, The Poison Poor Children Breathe, where he said, we Republicans are supposed to be for equal opportunity. But if poor and minority children have higher levels of lead in their brains, it's not equal from the very start of their lives. And ultimately, EPA was forced to abandon the effort to relax those lead limits. I actually argued the small refiner task force case in the DC circuit just six months after joining uh, uh, EDF. And in that decision, while they did give the small refiners more time, the uh, Pat Wald, in her uh, majority opinion, said, the health evidence is so overwhelming. Why are we allowing any lead in gasoline? Now, I have to differ just a little bit with Brian when he said OMB forced EPA to get lead out of gasoline. My perspective as someone who was working on it for EDF was that we approached Al Alm and Joe Cannon and said, look, you can solve the misfueling problem by getting rid of lead and gasoline that had been poisoning catalytic converters. And if you do a cost benefit analysis, which Reagan is supposed to be, his OMB is now instructed to use that, you'll see that there's enormous net benefits to just phasing lead out of gasoline entirely. 
And in fact, when they proposed to rescind the limits, they didn't do a cost-benefit analysis because they said, oh, the executive order only applies to things that are going to cost industry more money. If you're going to relax the limits, then we don't need to. It's automatically good because it will reduce cost to industry. Well, ultimately, they did that cost-benefit analysis, and OMB was so impressed with it. Ultimately, OMB stopped the total phase-out because they were bombarded with letters from the antique car community that said, this will destroy our vehicles. So they allowed a tiny bit of lead in gasoline. And finally, in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, Congress just banned lead in gasoline effective January 1st, 1996. Well, at the international level, Anne Gorsuch Burford was appointed to head the delegation to the Nairobi Earth Summit. Starting in Stockholm, nations of the world have gotten together every 10 years to have an environmental summit. That was not a very impressive uh, summit. Uh, she kind of lectured the developing countries that the market would save, uh, all solve all their problems. They actually had shifted. And instead, they were the ones demanding more environmental action than the developed countries were. Reagan also pointed to the delegation, one of his daughters, which was interpreted as showing that that's not a very important priority. But one great thing the Reagan administration did was with respect to the global phase out of CFCs. When these two scientists who were working on an environmental impact statement for the space shuttle program came up with the theory that uh, ozone, uh, that CFCs were so durable, they could deplete the ozone layer, the people in the US just stopped buying products that contained CFCs. And it wasn't until after the Vienna Framework Convention was adopted that the ozone hole was actually found by the scientists. And a major achievement was that George Shultz, Secretary of State, convinced Reagan, who had had skin cancer, that it was important to have a global treaty. Don Hodel on the left there, the Secretary of Interior, said, oh, we can just have people wear hats and sunglasses, which gave rise to this Herblot cartoon of animals and everyone having hats and sunglasses. <laughs> and he was widely derided for that. Lee Thomas went to Montreal in 1987 and played a key role in the negotiations because the European Union actually wasn't so enthused about phasing out CFCs. They thought it was a US plot to gain a trade advantage. But he actually confronted the EU delegate in a bar in Montreal. And they kind of worked things out over drinks. And there he is signing the Montreal uh, Protocol, which has been an enormous global success. Now, the 1992 Rio Earth Summit is considered probably the most successful of these summits. Uh, Bill Riley was EPA administrator at the time. Uh, 172 governments participated. The Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. President Bush went down there personally, despite it being in the middle of a presidential campaign, which he lost, which may explain why Obama did not go to the next Earth Summit uh, in the middle of a presidential campaign. But as one thing that Brian mentioned that I really agree with is the global nature of the leaded gasoline phase out. Uh, it had tremendous effects in reducing lead poisoning here in the United States, as this chart shows. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about how that became global. But when the George W. Bush administration took over, most people forget that during the presidential campaign, he was running against Al Gore, and he was afraid the climate change issue would actually work against him. So on September 29th, he gave a major speech where he said climate change is a serious problem. And while he didn't support the Kyoto Protocol that had been signed in 1997 but never submitted to the Senate for ratification, he would seek new legislation from Congress to control greenhouse gases. Now, he appointed Christy Todd Whitman to be his EPA administrator. And one of the first things she did was she went off to Trieste to an international environmental conference to meet all the other heads of the environmental agencies. Before she left, she checked with the White House to make sure that campaign pain pledge was still accurate, and they said it was. So she reassured the world that this new president's going to be really good on regulating greenhouse gases. But what happened behind the scenes was Dick Cheney did this kind of palace coup and got Bush to sign this letter disavowing that campaign pledge. Now, the 2002 World Summit uh, on Sustainable Development uh, didn't produce any landmark treaties, 
But one thing that happened here was they formed the Clean Fuels and Clean Vehicles Partnership, which was a public-private initiative with NGOs, governments, private industry, to spread the word about the incredible benefits of phasing lead out of gasoline. And as you can see from this map today, virtually every country in the world has eliminated lead in gasoline. A uh, study by economists suggests that this has produced between two and three trillion dollars in net benefits each year. So one of the top achievements, now there's a similar global alliance to eliminate lead-based paint that EPA has joined as well as part of this public-private partnership. President Obama, of course, as we know, played a major role in getting the Copenhagen Accord. He also, the U.S. government at the time, really promoted transparency with China and the U.S. Embassy started a real-time Twitter feed of particulate levels in China. And when the Chinese complained, we said, well, Twitter is banned in China, so it's only Americans going to get to see this. But of course, most Chinese have VPNs that can work around it. And it ultimately led the Chinese government to move towards greater transparency. And when President Obama met Xi Jinping for the very first time, he got him to agree to two very important things to agree to use the Montreal Protocol to phase out hydrofluorocarbons, and that led to the Minamata Treaty, which was signed in October of 2013. Of course, the U.S. delegation that was there for the signing ceremony had to leave because there was a government shutdown that occurred while they were already over in Japan. But Obama's Climate Action Plan pledged to reclaim international leadership on climate change and working in secret with the Chinese government, they reached this agreement where the Chinese for the very first time committed to cap their greenhouse gas emissions. They have the largest greenhouse gas emissions in the world, which led to this cartoon that I think sort of says it all, because the main uh, objection in Congress from the climate deniers was, well, China's not doing anything to control their emissions. This helped lead to the Paris Climate Accord, of course, Trump had vowed on the campaign trail that he would cancel that accord as though one country could do so. He had previously said that global warming was created by and for the Chinese to hurt U.S. manufacturing. The day after Obama took office, I got an email from the State Department saying, would you go on a speaking tour of China because we want to talk up the importance of them agreeing to limit their emissions. And I got nothing but pushback from the Chinese. They were saying the same thing, that global warming is a U.S. hoax that was created, even some of the top public interest environmental lawyers. And ultimately, there was a battle in the Trump administration that's recounted in Woodward's book, Fear. Ivana Trump lobbied hard for her father not to withdraw from Paris, whereas Steve Bannon and Scott Pruitt unannounced showed up at the White House and tried to get Trump to sign a statement saying he was withdrawing from Paris. But fortunately, the deputy chief of staff stopped them from doing it. But a few weeks later, he did, in fact, do that. And in response to that, uh, what happened was the only two countries who hadn't joined the Paris Accord, which were Nicaragua, which thought that it wasn't stringent enough, and Syria, which is fighting a civil war, both ratified the Paris Climate Accord. So now we will be the only country if our pullout becomes effective the day after the next presidential election. Finally. EPA does so many things in cooperation with so many countries, as illustrated by this organizational chart. Just last May, I was at the National Judges College in Beijing training new environmental judges, and there you see on the left, Kathy Stein, an EPA uh, judge on the EPA uh, Appeals Board. Uh, so just a couple of quick conclusions. With, when it, you're dealing with the international reach, uh, realm, it's not just EPA, it's EPA working with other agencies, like the State Department. And the President's position on these issues is going to be vital because he has some, so much power in foreign affairs. There's a rising influence of private-public partnerships, as Mike indicated. EPA traditionally has been the real global leader, and it still is on a lot of the technical and scientific issues. Um, and the one reason the EPA does not get pushback from Congress on this stuff is that this should be a bipartisan issue that generates bipartisan support. Businesses want a global level playing field 
So they support having other countries upgrade their environmental standards so they can be more like ours. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to Jonathan for organizing a really, really great conference, and I really appreciate being invited uh, to, to speak at this event, um, and I've learned a ton from hearing all the other speakers. Uh, so I, uh, we're, we're kind of going to go from EPA's impact at the international level to EPA's impact at the lo lo very local level. Uh, it's interesting to me, actually, that we don't have anybody here at the conference who's really talked about EPA's impact on the states, because usually that's that's a kind of a gotten more attention than EPA's impact on, on cities, which is what I'm going to focus on, using New York City as a case study. So um, EPA's really had a major impact on cities, um, on local government itself, and also on the landscape of cities. And uh, we don't tend to think about that too much. Uh, we tend to focus, as I said, more on EPA's impact on states when we're thinking about its impact on, on lower levels of government within the U.S. Cities are differently positioned than states vis-a-vis -vis EPA. So um, states often are delegated authority by EPA or by the uh, major, um, uh, under provisions pursuant to the major federal environmental statutes. Whereas cities are often actually regulated entities, especially under the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Because cities are major purveyors of drinking water and they're managing wastewater, they're actually often big polluters. And so they get regulated by EPA or over time as um, the states have taken over more enforcement responsibility, they get regulated directly by the states, which are enforcing against them standards set at the federal level. So what I'm going to talk about is basically the impact that EPA's had on New York City and its management of New York City's drinking water and of the way, and of the way that the city manages its wastewater. And I think, you know, this is an, in large measure a very happy story, I would say, that EPA has played a very significant role in forcing the city to upgrade its management of drinking water and wastewater. Um, and it's kind of an illustration, I think, of an argument that people often give for federal regulation, that federal regulation ensures some minimum level of quality across the board, no matter where you are in the country. Um, but there are some caveats to my story as well, which will kind of be interspersed um, as I tell it. So, um, first of all, EPA, as, as uh, somebody made a comment this morning, I think it was Joe Alfie, I, uh, Joe Aldi, I don't think we can say that you know, EPA is the only reason why water quality has improved in New York City or other cities across the U.S. States, too, over time have played a major role, especially in enforcing federal standards and sometimes the, their state standards against cities. Um, and also there have been significant economic changes, like the deindustrialization of major cities, which um, have undoubtedly improved water quality in cities as well as, as a lot of heavy industries have moved away uh, from American cities. Okay, now a second um, sort of caveat is I don't think that EPA's uh, record vis-a-vis -vis cities is totally, totally flawless. So in some instances, I think it's fair to say that EPA decisions have reinforced political process failures at the local level. So to the extent that environmental justice communities are marginalized sometimes at the local level decision making, EPA has not always made decisions that have helped to counteract that marginalization. And there's an example of that from the New York City experience, which I'll talk about. And um, moreover, I think that uh, cities often, um, and this is an argument that the cities would make, it's hard for me to evaluate this from a neutral perspective, but uh, there's probably a good argument, at least the, uh, cities make it, that often EPA regulation is very rigid and has forced cities to make investments in managing water infrastructure that are not um, cost beneficial. 
that wouldn't pass a cost-benefit analysis test. And so just, uh, just in light of the comment this morning that we heard about how, um, from Administrator Wheeler, about how uh, the EPA is forcing New York City to build this uh, uh, cover for the Hill, Hillview Reservoir. So basically, this has a very long history. Um, and uh, in the Obama administration, kind of the Obama administration backed off this idea of requiring the city to build this reservoir cover because the city says this is a very, very expensive proposition costing over a billion dollars and that the benefits of it wouldn't, wouldn't um, outweigh the costs. Uh, so now, on the other hand, the current Trump administration um, has come in, as we heard, with a very different point of view. And there is a legal basis for the position that they're taking. Um, some would argue this obligation on the city's part goes back to 1996. But the, whole, the kind of the saga illustrates this bigger point which I'm making, which is that from the city's perspective, there are arguments about how cost beneficial some of these federal standards and requirements have been that have been imposed on cities. Okay, so now let me go briefly to talking about EPA's impact on the management of New York City drinking water, and then I'll talk about EPA's impact on the management of wastewater in New York City. Okay, so just by way of background, you need to know a little bit about where New York City gets its drinking water. So essentially, you know, in the early, uh, in the, in, in the early 1800s, the city was getting its drinking water from within the city from wells and ponds because the water that surrounds the city is brackish, okay? So at some point that water from wells and ponds becomes too polluted, so then the city starts building, it starts to basically get its water from further north. Initially, it, it, bu it, it uh, builds a water supply system under which it's getting water from what's called the Croton area or around Westchester County for those of you who know New York City a bit. So that's like the most southern southernmost green point um, on, the, on this map here that you see. Okay, so that Croton Reservoir System is built in 1842 by New York City with some state authority um, and it's regarded as an engineering feat because it basically brings New York, uh, drinking water from New York City you know, uh, by gravity. Uh, to, to the city. Then the city needs more and more water, its population is growing, also you get the invention of indoor water closets, so consumption grows and so forth, so eventually uh, the city has to go even further north and that's that bigger green area. Um, and in the early 20th century it starts to build the Catskill and Dred Delaware um, water supply systems. And those also are major engineering feats because they also bring water basically by gravity down to the city. Okay, so what's really important to know about this, a couple of things is these areas, they're not, it's not, um, there's not a lot of publicly owned land in these watershed areas from which New York City is getting its water. This is mainly privately owned land in those watershed areas. And the city, I guess, lacking, you know, in foresight, although, uh, they were very innovative in many ways. They didn't acquire big buffer areas surrounding these watershed areas. So over time, what starts to happen um, after the city uh, finishes the last reservoir in the, in the Catskills, Delaware area, and, um, over time, there's more and more development that occurs in these watershed areas authorized by the city and the state. And um, in particular, the development occurs in the Croton area, the southernmost of those uh, uh, green areas. Okay, so the water, that development basically means, um, that sort of unchecked development basically means that there are more and more threats to the city's water quality. The city really does nothing um, for most of the 20th century to protect the quality of um, the, uh, the water it's getting from the watershed area. Okay, it doesn't really do anything to restrain land use or development in that watershed area, even though it actually did have some legal authority granted by New York State to control land use in those areas. Okay, so the result is that uh, by the early 1980s, about of the third of about a third of New York City's water supply is kind of a borderline quality. Okay. So what happens here? Well, of course, there's the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act that comes into being, but it initially doesn't really reach surface water. Um, uh, it, it doesn't really initially have too much impact on New York City's water supply or the city's management of its water supply. 
when it does start to have an impact is after the 1986 amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act that require um, EPA to set criteria for uh, surface water systems like New York system um, to avoid filtration. Okay, so basically um, in 1989, EPA introduces the surface water quality treatment rule. And as a result of that rule, basically EPA says to New York City, well, you have to either really improve the management of land use in that watershed area from which you're getting your water, or you're going to have to build a massive filtration plant to filter the water you're getting from that upper Catskill, Delaware region. And the city estimates that would cost between six to eight billion dollars. Okay, so it, de it desperately tries to avoid having to build this filtration plant um, with a bit of help from New York State, which brings all the parties together. The city ultimately is able to avoid having to build that six to eight billion dollar filtration plant by signing a deal with the upstate communities under which the city pays 1.2 billion dollars to protect that watershed area. Um, um, in exchange for those communities accepting basically more um, land use regulation by the city. So this is an example, I think you could say, of basically EPA through the Safe Drinking Water Act helping to improve and, and protect drinking water quality for a major New York City, uh, sorry, a major US city. And we of course see other examples where EPA has come in um, to, to protect drinking water quality. So the, New York water, the Newark water crisis would be an example, although this is too an example where the state is also playing somewhat of a role. Now, it's not totally a positive story. Think about Flint water crisis, where one might say that EPA's role was, you couldn't totally praise EPA in that context. Okay, so I've talked a bit about the impact on uh, the management of drinking water supply, which you would have thought actually that the city itself would have had a strong incentive to protect the quality of its drinking water, given that its residents bear the costs of poor drinking water quality. But even for drinking water, the city was really under protecting until we get federal regulation in, in, implemented initially through EPA. Now, what about the other problem, the problem of dealing with the wastewater? Okay, so uh, going back historically, um, you know, initially there's no real sewer system or anything like that in cities like New York. But after the city builds the big water supply system to bring in water from the Croton area I mentioned earlier, then as water consumption increases, especially with the advent of, of indoor toilets, it needs to build a sewage system. And that it starts to do in the 1850s. Okay? But in, but what does it do? A big decision it confronts is what to do with the raw sewage. Initially, what the city does, and for a very long time, the city dumps raw sewage into the water bodies surrounding it, including the Hudson River. In fact, the city New York City dumped raw, untreated sewage into the Hudson River until 1986. Okay, and why? <laughs> and and what finally forces? New York City to basically, well, what is a key factor I don't want to attribute, it's, it's, uh, bearing in mind Joel, these comment about causation this morning, I don't want to say it's the only factor, but a key factor in prompting New York City to stop um, dumping raw sewage is EPA's actions. So in 1979, EPA went to court um, and got a court order that required New York City to basically um, treat sewage going into the Hudson by a through tr uh, primary treatment by 1986 and through secondary treatment by 1991. And that finally forces New York City to build and to complete the construction. It actually started the construction of the sewage treatment plant for the Hudson in 1972, but, but this court order finally forced the city to, um, to, fill, to, to complete construction of that sewage treatment plant by 1986. Okay, now let me just, um, I, I know I'm going to go like a few minutes over my time, but not too much. Um, so this is where the environmental justice uh, issue come, that I mentioned earlier comes into the story. The question here is where does that sewage treatment plant get built along the Hudson? Okay, so because of decisions that had been made in the 1960s at the local level, you know, long before EPA is in the picture, 
because of decisions made at the local level, behind closed doors, the local government had decided that the sewage treatment plant, which it knew would eventually have to be built along the Hudson, would be built off of Harlem, so next to the African and American and Latino neighborhood, rather than, say, further south, um, next to the Upper West Side, which is white and more affluent, and which Robert Moses wanted to upgrade. Okay, so um, the sewage treatment plant gets built off of Harlem. Now, what is EPA's role here? Well, obviously, EPA did not make that initial decision, but um, in um, 1979, EPA uh, sort of ratified that decision, I would say, or implicitly ratified that decision when it issued a finding of no significant impact under NEPA, FONSI, um, that basically allowed the city to avoid having to do an EIS and to also avoid having to do any serious analysis of the air quality impacts on the Harlem neighborhood of building the sewage treatment plant. Okay, so basically um, what ended up happening is the city builds the sewage treatment plant, which then has tremendous odor problems, produces tremendous odor problems and air emissions that plague the neighborhood, and which lead ultimately um, in the early 1990s to the formation of WE Act, a very major environmental justice group in the city, and to WE Act launching a, a, a kind of a landmark environmental justice lawsuit in the city using private, suing the city for private nuisance for um, the odors coming from this treatment plant, which the suit gets settled by David Dinkins, the first and to date only African American, African American mayor of New York City, just as he's leaving office. Okay? So, um, so you can see, in a sense, uh, what I'm saying about there's, a, there's political process failures at the local level that EPA, at least in this instance, arguably had an opportunity to correct and didn't correct, arguably because it was very much focused on the goal of getting the water treatment plant built. Okay, so maybe, and maybe this is an instance of sort of tunnel vision by the agency focusing on air quality, sorry, focusing on water quality improvement, neglecting the impact of air quality, it's all, but there's also this environmental justice issue that the air quality impacts were going to be felt by environmental justice communities. Okay, so just in the interest of wrapping up, let me just emphasize that um, the uh, upgrading of the sewage treatment plants and the construction of this new sewage treatment plant that, um, uh, the, clean, uh, that the Clean Water Act um, uh, forces basically has had a tremendous impact on water quality around New York City. So this kind of impossible for you to see this map, but, but take my word for it that the map, if we had more time, would show these four maps would show that tremendous improvement. And this has affected the landscape around New York City. Okay, so since the year 2000, there have been five parks that have been created over, uh, that are over 20 acres in side, size in New York City, and they're all along the waterfront. Okay. These improvements in the water quality have really made the waterfront a much more attractive place to be. Now, this is also undoubtedly connected with the deindustrialization of New York City and the move changes in, in port technology as well. But the, nobody would want to be by the Hudson River if there was like still a ton of raw sewage being there. So this is an example of how um, EPA has really had a major impact on the landscape of a major U.S. city. So just by way of conclusion, let me, let me throw out um, a thought about the future. I've been talking a lot about the impacts of EPA at the local level in New York City in the past. I think an interesting question for the next 50 years is as we confront climate change, which, also, which means a lot for coastal cities, right? They're going to face more flooding. They're going to face you know, more rainstorms. So they have new water, water management challenges now. Um, in an era of climate change. And I think an interesting question is, well, what role will EPA play in promoting cities to adapt to these new water quality challenges? Okay, will it set some standards to, and, and require cities to meet certain standards about um, you know, having the facilities to catch stormwater or to, uh, to deal with flooding? Okay, and if it sets standards, will it couple those standards or will Congress couple those standards with new funding? to enable cities to build infrastructure to manage flooding or to manage increases in stormwater. I think that's a new challenge 
for the next 50 years at the local level. In the discussion period, I mean, why don't we start, I mean, if anyone on the panel has a discussion they'd like to direct towards their fellow panelists. Or we uh, could open I've, I've got a question for Professor Percival. So something I'm seeing kind of on the international front, which I'd be interested in your perspective on given that very wonderful historical perspective, is something we're facing very unprecedented probably in coming decades, may well be as the world fails to manage climate change, geoengineering, injecting sulfates into the stratosphere starts to become discussed as a practical response to this. And if the U.S. is bowing out, as our current administration <coughs> is, what do you see as lessons we might learn from the past for how the world starts to look at um, addressing the law and policy around an international um, intentional interference with the environment? Yeah, that, that's going to be a, a really tough one because I, I do an analogy to the law of the sea tree. Mm -hmm. The law of the sea tree has been ratified by almost all the world. The U.S., for just pure ideological reasons of current opposition of at least 34 senators to ratifying any foreign treaty, uh, has made it impossible for us to ratify that. And yet the U.S. government's been operating as though we are doing everything we can to comply with it. But what that means is we have no role in nominating people to the dispute resolution <coughs> panel. And we keep hearing from China. It's one of the very few international treaties that has mandatory dispute resolution provisions. China kept saying, well, we ratified the law of the sea. The U.S. didn't. But then when the Philippines brought the case against China, they refused to participate in the mandatory dispute resolution. And now, after the adverse decision against them, have tried to buy out the Philippines from you know, trying to enforce it in the South China Sea. The amazing thing is that the military strongly supports ratifying it. Every U.S. president, including President Reagan, who initially was skeptical, but they made changes when the treaty was negotiated over a 10-year period, he bought into it. Both Presidents Bush, Obama, I don't know about Trump, but um, the business community supports ratification. Environmentalists support ratification. The Chamber of Commerce, I was at this hearing where I was the one uh, liberal witness when the House was in Republican hands, and next to me was their Chamber of Commerce chief lobbyist. I'm trying to think, well, how can I make conversation with him? It suddenly dawned on me, oh, you guys are supporting ratification of the law of the sea, and you're taking out all these full-page ads. And he says, yeah, but it's never going to happen. And when John Kerry was Secretary of State, he actually said, uh, we're going to try, or no, when he was head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he said, we're going to try to get it ratified, and we're deliberately going to do it after the election so people won't have to take political heat for it. And Jim DeMent, who was then the senator from South Carolina, circulated a letter that he got 34 other uh, senators to sign, saying under no circumstances will we be considered. So it was dead on arrival. So we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't participate in these international arrangements, particularly those that set up uh, and that's becoming increasingly important as climate change is affecting the Arctic and there's sort of this rush mm -hmm. on for the Arctic resources and there's going to be a lot of jockeying for who has sovereignty over what parts of the Arctic. So it, I think mm -hmm. the answer is it makes it absolutely critical that there mm -hmm. be some universal agreement on what would be permitted in the geoengineering context. And I, I think there's aren't there committees of the, uh, that have been set up under the Framework Convention of Climate Change? I mean, one of the things few people realize is the reason we even have a seat at all these conferences of the parties is because President George H.W. Bush not only signed the Framework Convention at Rio, but he got it ratified by Congress 99 to nothing just a few months after the Rio conference. So even though we never ratified the Kyoto Protocol, we get a seat at the table, which is really vital. Thanks.
I'm curious. Wait for the um, the microphone so okay. that uh, yeah. if anyone's, I don't know if anyone's still in the overflow at 415, but maybe they are. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about your graph on where you showed the um, environmental issues becoming much more partisan. Yes. Um, has anyone done an analysis of the influence of money in politics and decisions on um, you know, dark money and, and all that in terms of creating or helping to uh, widen the divide? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of research on that. I think there's, um, it's something where defining the terms of the research is itself in some ways so ideologically loaded that it's not an area that you're going to find um, a clear objective answers that everybody can agree on. But there's been a lot of dark money. There's been a lot of research discussing the impact of that dark money and the, and actually not only dark money, but just money that's actually out in the open on strongly influencing um, the policy process and public opinion. So, Can I just um, add a citation on that? John Antanasio has an excellent book mm -hmm. on this called Politics and Capital, published by Oxford. And it collects mm -hmm. all that research, and he and finds a very clear uh, relationship. Yeah. And I would just say there's one there's one deeper piece of that from my perspective. So I think that um, you know, the campaign finance issue is a huge one. I think gerrymandering is a very important piece of this, both legal gerrymandering, but also the fact that we are as a country moving into communities with people who are like us more and more. We are self-selecting into gerrymandering. I'm working on a paper called Market Democracy, just because I'm in a bomb-throwing mode today. I'll throw this out there. I'm going to argue that I think in many areas the market is better reflecting what we think of as majoritarian preferences than is government today. By the time you get done with dark money and uh, gerrymandering, and largely because of worldview-driven issues. So, for example, um, who is the largest regulator? The 70, 80 percent of the American population thinks we should ban assault weapons, right? Who's the largest regulator of assault weapons in the U.S. today? Walmart doesn't sell the bullets, and Dix won't sell the weapons, and now Colt won't make them for sale. Uh, you know, which state, uh, certainly in the area we live in, uh, you know, is banning assault weapons? Uh, so, interestingly enough, I think what we're seeing is Again, public preferences get reflected somewhere, and if you're a Dix, you, you're operating in a lot of different jurisdictions. You can't afford to be on the wrong side of some of these issues, even though as a politician you may be able to gerrymander your way out of democratic control on some level. So there's a lot more to be dealt with on that, but I think to me dark money is a piece of it, but it feeds into a series of other issues like gerrymandering, like the strong perceptions of worldview, which is something that we've studied a great deal. And you know, once we know a couple of questions about your worldview, we can predict way more than we should be able to about your opinions about climate change and other things. Right here? Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, I found the um, piece on the M EPA's um, impact on cities really important. And one thing I'd like to hear more about is um, the impact in terms of their emergency response capabilities and Superfund on cities. Because they don't really have the infrastructure to deal with some of the big things that happen. Like, for example, locally we had um, somebody decide they wanted to recycle fluorescent light bulbs um, from various places like Toys R Us and all these different places. And there really wasn't a market solution to this either because uh, this person brought in like six to eight million light bulbs into a warehouse in the middle of a residential area in the inner city, talk about environmental justice, um, and just let them pile up and pile up and pile up. And um, they were broken and there was no infrastructure in this warehouse in terms of firefighting equipment, not even a fire extinguisher. And um, so the local city kept trying to get US EPA to help because they don't have the money it would cost to get rid of 8 million broken fluorescent light bulbs with mercury in them. And of course, the US EPA, you know, not having a ton of money, you know, didn't get right to it. Well, then there were four fires in a week. And it sent 16 firefighters to the hospital to have to be tested for mercury poisoning. Again, the city didn't have the money to go and vac up all of the mercury now that is in the water the firefighters had to use to put out the fire. And, you know, this is, was really scary, too, when the government shut down. 
because everybody in the media was talking about, you know, the parks are shut down and this is really bad and that, you know, veterans should be able to go to the Veterans Memorial. And, and I completely agree with that. But they weren't talking about how only 3% of the U.S. EP staff, EPA staff was working. And I happen to know U.S. EP, a particularly dedicated staff person, who was putting out a fire in Michigan at a hazardous waste landfill for days without any pay. And I think if the public heard these stories, you wouldn't have that, you know, um, information deficit model when it comes to these things. You know, you may have that with some things, but the quality of that information, if it got out there, that why we need the U.S. EPA, especially um, in terms of their emergency response and super fund resources, when industry or, you know, the free enterprise system leaves behind, um, you know, undercapitalized pieces of land, giant brownfield sites. We need that money and we need that expertise in terms of Superfund. And if people really thought about that, I think they wouldn't want to dismantle the EPA like, like some people do. I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, I focused on the impact that EPA's had through its uh, implementation of, of the State Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act. But you could also really tell a story about the impact of EPA on, on, local, on localities through Superfund and, and other statutes as well. And um, this is definitely the case. They've had a major impact on landscapes <laughs> through Superfund. And, um, you know, I think that what, you, the, what your talent, what, the, what the events you were describing, they really illustrate and, you know, the fa some of the foundational arguments for having EPA and having federal environmental regulation in the first place was that you just don't have the resources and the expertise at the local level um, in, in many to, to deal with a lot of complex pollution problems. And what I think what you know the story I tell says that you don't even have the resources and the expertise in America's largest city often to deal with some very complex problems. So you know you know that's a it, it's a kind of illustrates the, the limits in some sense of local authority and the need for federal regulation. So I have the mic, sorry Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, uh, it was a great panel, it was really fun to hear from all of you, I love the kind of range of perspectives um, and uh, localities and so forth. So um, this is a question for Michael and Jonathan and I also um, enjoyed the Michael Jonathan show. I have seen Mike, <laughs> Mike speak a lot and never gotten to see his co-author, so it's fun to see the two of you that way. Go, yeah. going back and forth, interrupting each other and so forth. I enjoyed that. Um, so here, so I want to push back a little on the idea that the private um, uh, efforts on climate change are all about the private sector and blur the lines uh, more and also uh, give a big shout out to states given that I come from a state where we still like government and we still like government involvement in the environment. Um, so the efforts, particularly on climate change, that the private sector is making are largely, as, as I have heard you, Mike, before say, and I think I understand, is um, big purchases of re renewable power and um, things like Walmart promoting the LED light bulb, a lot of energy efficiency moves. Those come out of government policies. So the reason that we have renewable energy available for Apple and other firms to purchase is because of tax credits, production tax credits, um, renewable portfolio standards around the, st the country, et cetera. And so maybe one kind of friendly amendment is that we need, instead of thinking about comprehensive federal environmental laws, we can think about areas where we can push to get fed to the private sector adopting things that, that they don't develop on their own. They do this because of of government policy. Same thing with electric vehicles. If you're talking about fleets, you know, shifting into zero emission vehicles, et cetera, that's all because of government policy. So I just, I just resist, I guess, the effort to separate these things into private and public quite so dramatically, because I think public really plays a very, very important role here, even if it's not in the form of giant federal environmental statute. Yeah. So yeah, have, I'd, I'd like, to, I'd like to respond and then Mike can disagree with me. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I think I, I think actually I agree completely with what you're saying. And one of the reasons we focus so much on private sector is we feel there's a lot of writing about the public sector and the role of the private sector has been neglected. But we by no means 
want or intend to diminish the role of the public sector, which can be at the federal, state, and local level. And I think one of the most interesting and promising places are where you have the synergies. So some states have RPSs, other ones don't. And there's been private sector push it, pushback against that. So in the southeast, where we have a lot of very high energy consuming states that have no public interest in um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we've seen big companies like Amazon and Facebook pushing on those states to reform their utility regulations to be more friendly to renewable energy. And then once that happens, other parties start to be more interested in adopting it. Um, the Walmart and the light bulb, this comes out in part of the federal 2007 um, energy efficiency standards, but then after Congress takes all the enforcement funding away from that, Walmart is pushing forward on the technological innovation. So I think there are real synergies and interrelationships, and we're trying to push for a don't look for one big magic bullet on this. We need to throw everything we've got at the problem private sector can play some role, but that doesn't at all replace the really, really important role that the public sector plays. And I think your point about the interaction between the two is absolutely critical. Yeah, so totally agree on that. And uh, 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 so I think a, a lot of what we're trying to do is simply to say, you know, we shouldn't be, um, as environmental law professors and people who are advising on environmental law and policy, uh, just thinking about what government can do. But it doesn't mean that in a lot of these areas, government didn't trigger much of the action that ultimately occurred, and we're very interested in those places where that occurs. We've actually studied, um, I had an NSF grant to look at spillover effects, which we did at the individual level, but they occur at the federal private level as well. There are interactions of all types. Um, but but uh, the reason, again, that we are focused on the private sector as, as, as much as we are is just because, again, what we keep seeing in the literature, uh, and I look at the four or 500 articles our colleagues publish every year as a part of the LPAR journal that we publish, you know, very little bit of it is viable today. We are, we are, we are, um, we are engaging in a utopian view of the future, in my view, and so we're not being realistic enough about thinking what happens if, um, what happens if we don't get another a major new pollution control statute in another decade. Um, so, absolutely, we have to be thinking about the, at the public sector. We don't at all want to minimize, and in fact, we both, I think, would would support a comprehensive solution to the environmental, mm -hmm. to the, the climate problem tomorrow if we could yeah. get one. I think we're just trying to make sure, as a risk management, in effect, that we're thinking hard about the private sector. In our part of the country, the south, southeastern U.S. would be the sixth largest country in the world if it were a country, and the states yeah, in the I'm south. Five, so. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're always better. I know, but. Uh, <laughs> um, but the southeastern states are, are not neutral. They're actively trying to discourage efforts to reduce carbon emissions in some cases. Uh, the Trump administration recently issued an executive order that was designed to promote fossil fuels, and it includes a provision in it that requires the Secretary of Labor to study the fiduciary duties of ERISA fund managers to identify if they're violating those fiduciary duties if they screen out climate-sensitive stocks. Okay? That's not a neutral phenomenon. That's an effort to try to stop the financial community from addressing the climate problem. The New York Times just did a study that showed that, uh, or published a, an article about a study that showed that the major banks are differentially offering to Fran Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac those loans that are most climate sensitive in terms of flooding because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have to accept loans. Right? So in some cases, the government is explicitly or implicitly muting the effects or the incentives that the marketplace would otherwise be giving. So uh, um, I think the other thing I would say is that we look a lot at the notion of the panacea bias, which Eleanor Ostrom wrote a lot about, that we all try to say, what will solve the problem? And I think our perspective is there is no one solution that will solve the problem. It will be a combination of government at the state level, at the local level, uh, and at the federal and international level, but with a private sector piece to buy some time in the interim. So yeah, the only thing that I would yeah. discourage is when I've heard you present yeah. in the past, you don't give credit to the way in which the public sector actually drives the Yeah, future. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But they're, at the not, they're not, they're not Both drives and discourages. I mean, yeah. today, to be realistic, we have to, but, but we, you're absolutely right. We need a slide in there that just makes it absolutely yeah. clear that, recognition. That's right. Absolutely it could right. be. I just want to kind of share also one final anecdote on this is when, you know, the first paper on private governance that Mike and I wrote together back in uh, 2007 
Um, we talked about motor vehicle idling, all the unnecessary emissions that come from that and the potential economic benefits of people simply not idling their cars too much. And one of the conclusions from my analysis on that, going deep into the engineering analysis, was that the optimal solution would be a federal technology mandate that every car have a motor that automatically shuts off when you stop. The economies of scale and production would bring those much cheaper and there would be hundreds of dollars a year of savings for the average person doing it. That would be the optimal thing, but government still hasn't mandated anything like that. And then in the meantime, private efforts to get people to change their behavior and shut off the engine when they're in a drive through lane or waiting to pick someone up can have a big benefit until finally maybe someday we will get that technology. Forget about California. Yeah. California, yeah. California yeah. is wonderful yeah. that way. Right. Yes. California announced them to do it. You're much more likely to yeah. have well. it happen, and then yep. 177 is, states can opt in. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you, you, and you, you do actually have at gas the gas local gas level anti-idling uh, ordinances. A lot of yes. new, but if you look at those, those are designed to reduce um, particulate pollution yes. rather than climate. Yeah, right. we did a study of those. Yeah. 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 Last, uh, last question. Last question. Uh, I. I think this is for Bob and Michael and Jonathan um, asking you to speculate whether or not there's an obvious reason that geoengineering itself won't migrate into the private domain. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I'll talk about that. that. That could happen. I was actually at a summer school on geoengineering governance and, we, and uh, one group there was wargaming exactly that. What happens if Google and a bunch of other tech companies decide to do it privately. It's a real, it's a real possibility. Yeah, send them right. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, the tort risks, I would think of, you know, if you can, again, maybe the courts would throw those out, but I would think that would be certainly on the risk management screen of managers before they thought about throwing sulfate aerosols in the environment. But again, it hasn't kept them from throwing CO2 in the environment. When you're about to start seeing these trials in the climate nuisance litigation that are in state court, you know, state common law tort against the fossil fuel industry for denying climate change and promoting disinformation while they, in fact, believe just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And that may have a much bigger impact uh, in mobilizing the private sector in the fossil fuel industry to radically change their policies. But let me just say that the, sort of the embedded sort of implication of that is we would want to stop it. So it's a fascinating question. Maybe what we should do is start actively setting up a private system to think about carefully governing that and induce the private sector to do it to avoid a cat catastrophic future. Who knows? Yeah. Well, on that light note, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to all of our very, panelists. Very quickly, um, uh, certainly thank all of our presenters today. Please join me again in thanking all of them.